Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jude. We are studying fleeing the spirit of this age. We looked at two meetings in the book of Jude we had in the last few weeks by which we can actually perform that uh, fleeing from the spirit of this age. Maybe I should put it this way, two, way, two ways that we can actively uh, flee the spirit of this age and not be consumed by the spirit of this age. So I entitled this lesson, Our Hope of Deliverance from the Spirit of this Age. I could also entitle that, Our Hope of Deliverance from the Spirit of Apostasy. Uh, and because that's basically what it is, is, is departing from the truth of the Word of God. There are two primary means that God gives in the book of Jude, one in verse 3, the other in verse number 20, by which we can flee the spirit of this age or the spirit of apostasy. In verse number three, he says this, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. So the first means of fleeing the, the uh, spirit of this age is to actively get involved and contend for the faith. A simple definition of the word contend is to diligently pro, not only proclaim the truth, but diligently defend the truth. Uh, you can actually, uh, uh, perhaps, in, uh, uh, the greatest way that you can contend for the faith in this, is in this desire to flee the spirit of apostasy and of this age uh, is to demonstrate its power and effectiveness in your daily walk. This is very important in the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because in verse number four, it says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, and we'll see in a few moments by the way, ungodly, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And lasciviousness simply means filthy, loose living, with no moral boundaries. Does that sound familiar? Don't tell me what to do. Nobody tells me how to live. And so that is the desire of these men. And I want you to notice God said, crept in unawares. Crept in where? Into the assembly of the saints. It might be crept in, they may creep into your life. In the job place, they may creep into your life among your family. And so we have got to be highly skilled in the truth and the use of the word of righteousness. We've got to know how to diligently proclaim the truth with spiritual understanding. We've got to know how to defend the truth, whether it's on the job, in our family, whether it's actually in the assembly. And I believe the context here has to do primarily with men that have crept in unawares into the assembly and they're seeking, they have a goal, according to verse number four, their goal is to turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and, and to filthily uh, just a loose living, non-moral lifestyle with no boundaries. Uh, and then he also says, here's a second part of their goal, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They want to have an ill effect on the assembly of God to the point to where they too will actually perform and do the, uh, the basis essential practices that cause these men to be evil, wicked seducers. And what that is, and God tells us what that is in, in this passage right here, and he says that they are murderers, they're complainers in verse 16, and he says this, walking after their own lusts. Walking after their own lusts. And I really desire in this teaching to parallel the Christian life. It doesn't sound like these people's, people are believers, 
but they are crept in to deceive the believers, uh, unaware, crept in unawares. That, that simply means the word crept, that term crept in unawares, it means that they have come in slyly. They, and it actually means that the root meaning of it is to come alongside of in a very deceitful manner. And they come speaking guile. But they are hard to detect because they know the language. They know the, the, the cliches. They know the Baptist cliches. They, they know how to come in and gain your confidence. And so we're going to look at some tools here that will actually expose them. And, and not just expose them, but expose the same truths or falsehoods in your and my own life. Why, why could I say it that way? Because not only are they capable of walking after their own lust, and they were, we also are capable of walking after our own lust. And if we do that, we studied last week, a week before last, we studied Ephesians 4 about the unworthy walk in Ephesians 4, 17. And that downward spiral from 17, 18, 19, and, and it started off walking as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. In other words, they're walking in the flesh. They're walking after their own lust. They're not walking in the Spirit of God. That's, that's where it started. And it ended up in lasciviousness. That's what it teaches over in Ephesians 4, 19 or 20, I think it is. And so what God was telling the Ephesian believers is that you too can walk in the vanity of your minds. You too can walk after your own lust. And if you do that, here's the downward spiral, spiral in 17, 18, and 19. And this will, this will be accomplished in your life as well as it was accomplished in their life, even though they're, they're lost and you are saved. And what will happen? You will end up turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. I will end up denying the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll deny our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Never, 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 you would say. You might say never, really, I would never deny the, the Lordship. I would never deny the Lord God. Oh, really? Let me ask you a quick question. How intimate is your fellowship with the Father? It's a good question for all of us to ask. How much, how much time, how much quality fellowship have you had today with the Father? How about, how about yesterday? How, how much knowledge and spiritual understanding do you have about making the throne room your living room and having intimate fellowship not only with the Father, but with the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated there with the Father? How real is that to you? The average Christian, unfortunately, that I talk to you knows very little about fellowshipping with the Father and with the Son. And, and, and certainly very little about intimate, consistent fellowship with the Father and the Son. May I say to you, you're denying our only Lord God His greatest pleasure. His, his greatest pleasure in saving you and birthing you and washing you with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and making you a child of God, his greatest pleasure is your fellowship. His greatest pleasure, his greatest desire is my fellowship. Just like it was in the garden. What did he want from Adam and Eve? He wanted their fellowship. He wanted their love. He wanted their loyalty. He wanted them to walk together in harmony and in the unity of the Spirit. And that's exactly what he wants now. And when we deny him that, we are denying our Lord God His greatest desire. Yes, we too can deny the Lord. So, I gave you, I started off a week or so ago, and I started off giving you seven steps. Um, what, would I, what did I call that? It, it, it's seven steps, and it, it, these steps too are really a downward spiral. But it's seven steps that we can take to where we too will turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. So the first one I gave you is walking after our own lust. 
But now I turn this thing around. And, and what I, what I, the way I want to teach this is I don't want to teach it in a negative fashion. I want to teach this as evidences perhaps that you are fleeing the spirit of this age. I, I want to teach this as steps that will enable you, absolutely make you capable of fleeing the spirit of this age. And so the first one, I, I, I put it this way. Do not walk after your, your own lust. Now, I want, I want to look at Scripture. I want to back all this up to Scripture. If, if you'll look with me over at verse number 16. Uh, in fact, look with me at verse 14 real quick. And it says here in verse 14, Jude, verse number 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these... Now, the these that he's talking about are the ungodly men that crept in unawares. And God says in verse 10, they were brute beasts. And they were corrupting themselves. And sadly enough, they're not only corrupting themselves, but their goal and their desire is to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and to corrupt others as well. Who are those others? They're the others that they are deceitfully creeping up along beside. And don't forget, we're talking about in the assembly. You need to be spiritually aware of who you are fellowshipping and yoking up with. If these people are complainers and murmurers, they're never satisfied with the church and the pastor and what's going on, and, and they always have a negative word, let that be a word of caution to you about their character and, and whether or not you should be spending time fellowshipping with them, yoking up with them, making friends with them because they may be those that have crept in unawares in the church that are seeking to do damage to the church and to the grace of God, turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And so he says here, Enoch's talking about the last of the last days. He prophesied of these people, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, when's that going to happen? Revelation 19. That's going to happen when Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation period. Notice, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all, now listen, to convince all that are ungodly. Now, in verse 4, God's already told us these men that crept in unawares are ungodly men. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners, now listen, have spoken against him. Now, this is very revealing. Now, listen have spoken against him. Now, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. This verse reveals to us in the assembly how we can detect these men, evil men, ungodly men that have crept in unawares. And God says here, they have spoken against him. Now notice, how do they speak against him? How do we perceive that they're speaking against him? Well, well, follow the mind of the Holy Spirit right into the next verse. He says right here, these are what? Murmurers. These are complainers walking after their own lust. Now notice, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in advantage Oh, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And what I want us to look at this. A sure evidence that they were walking in the lust of their flesh. Listen, a sure evidence that they were walking after the lust of their own flesh, God said, is that they were murderers and they were complainers. Now let me ask you this. Could, that possi could it possibly be that are sure evidence that you and me is it you and I? 
We, it, it can be a sure evidence that we are walking in the lust of our flesh. What could be? Murmuring and complaining. What did God say? God said they have spoken against him. Folks, this is the way God looks at murmuring and complaining. He looks at that as speaking against his goodness to his children. We are saying God is insufficient. God does not care for me like he says he does. God does not provide for me, does not protect me. We are speaking against God when we murmur and complain about our state of life at any given moment. To better understand that, let me just give you a root idea here of what the word complaining means. It, the, if you look it up, the root meaning of the word complaining means to strike out. To strike, we're not talking about a ball game here, we're, we're talking about the game of life. To strike out, and what it means, the idea is to strike out against. And so the word that the Holy Spirit chose to use here means to strike out against God. We're murmuring against God. We're complaining against God. It means to utter expressions of grief or pain or discomfort or just dissatisfaction with, with the situation. Mm, does that sound familiar? You know, if that is describing our life, it, it, it's a sure evidence that we are not walking in the Spirit. We are walking in the flesh. But you know what? It's also a very good evidence that we are easy prey for the spirit of this age. We are easy prey to fall into the same trap that so many have already fallen into and to be overcome by the spirit of apostasy and the spirit of this age. So let us be mindful of that. It also means this, to admit or express sorrow and regret for your present state. To lament. To be sorrowful that you're in the state that you're in. Now, folks, let me say, that, say this about that. God has not failed you. Faithful is he who calls you all, who also will do it. We can give you scripture after scripture after scripture about God's care. If God has not failed you. If you are dissatisfied with the state that you are presently in, you are pr probably in that state because you're not walking in the spirit. You are walking in the flesh, and you are the cause of being in that state that you're so dissatisfied with. It, it means this. It means to express annoyance with and resentment against. Folks, don't forget. What do we say? Oh, the root idea is to strike out against. So if you're annoyed, who are you annoyed with? If there's resentment, who are you resenting? God. It means to find fault with how life or others are treating you. Poor me. Mm. And with that in mind, I'll finish with this. It means to grumble. <laughs> are you a grumble, grumbler? Are you a complainer? Nothing ever suits you, and nothing is ever right, or it's nothing is ever right enough. You know anyone like that? I hope it's not you that you know. But you know what? If it is, not throwing rocks at you. Love you in the Lord. This is all part of growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and maturing. It's part of being enlightened by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. It may be that as you're listening to this, God is enlightening your mind and your heart. And the Holy Spirit is touching you. And, and He's teaching you that, yes, you do fit the bill. And folks, if you do, He's not mad at you. He's seeking to, to sanctify you with the truth of the Word of God. To set you apart, make you more holy, make you more obedient. Let Him have His way with you. All right, that's number one. Number two is to walk in humility. Look with me at verse 16. 
These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their, now notice, and their mouth, those that have crept in unawares, the brute beasts that just corrupt themselves, their mouth speaketh great swelling words. You know what this indicates? This indicates they're full of pride. And you know what? Anybody that's walking after their own lust, including me, I'm full of pride. But I am, I am not full of humility. I am full of myself. Self-exaltation. I am full of pride. And speaking great swelling words, hey, it says, uh, it, it means full of pride. It means arrogant. You know, you can see that. Speaking great swelling words. It's always about me. It's always about self. It's always building self up. Who I am. <laughs> Who we think we are. It also means self-conceited. Self-disconceited. A conceited individual. So the opposite of that would be what? Walking in humility. If you want to escape and flee from the spirit of this age, from the spirit of apostasy, you need to walk in humility. And you know what? Humility is a work of the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus had to submit himself and to truth and walk in humility. It, said, it says in Philippians 2 8, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient to what? Unto the death of the cross. And what you and I need to do is let the Holy Spirit humble us, give us a humble spirit. Unto obedience, unto death. But not the death of the cross per se, even though we should bear our cross, but unto the death of that monster called self. So that we no longer walk consistently in the flesh after our own lust, but we walk in the spirit after God's desires, not our desires. All right, so number two is walking in humility. Number three, he says here in verse 16, let's take this right out of the scripture. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. See, this was the mindset. This was the carnal mindset of these men that had crept in unaware who were walking after their own lust. But I will tell you this. It's also the carnal mindset of the believer that is walking after their flesh to fulfill the desires of their flesh and not after the spirit. So let us learn from this. Having men's persons in ad admiration because of advantage. What we find here is that they were, they were men pleasers. They were men lovers. They were, they were hero exalters. Whether it be sports heroes uh, or perhaps uh, their heroes are movie stars. Perhaps it, who knows what avenue of life that that they, that we 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 fall before without even realizing it, and we become consumed with thoughts and desires to be like him or like her, a famous singer or a famous this, or and they become our heroes. Folks, we can have men's persons in admiration just as well as people that are unsaved can have them in admiration. And let, let me tell you this, this is another evidence that we're walking after the flesh, minding, as it says in Romans 8, the things of this flesh and of this world. When we should be walking in the Spirit and minding the things of the Spirit. If we will mind the things of the Spirit, you know what we'll do? Did you know the mind affects the heart? If we will mind the things of the Spirit, we will set our affections on things above. Not things below, not people below, not heroes below. Let me just give you a simple definition of this word advantage. Having men's persons in admiration. And it says because of advantage. 
Hmm. Now look at that. I thought, well, what in the world is that? What does that mean? I looked it up. In, in, in this context, in, the idea is this. They had men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Because the, the word advantage basically means benefits. It basically means to, pr to promote one's cause or to, now listen, or to promote one's image. People, folks, can become consumed, saved and lost, with sports heroes. And I'm talking about totally consumed. It's all they talk about. They have such admiration for that sports hero. They identify with that sports hero. They wear their shirt with their number on it. They wear their shoes with their name on it. Men's persons in admiration because of the advantage. And according to the definition of this word, it is, I picked this right out of the dictionary. The promoting of one's cause or image in the eyes of others. Oh, can you see what's going on here? This, this society today is consumed with the love of men and heroes and hero worship and, and men exaltation. They are there. They talk about them. They, they wear their clothes. They, they, this edition of that, that edition of that, and it's got their name. And folks, it's because they think it enhances their image in the eyes of others. Isn't that sad? Isn't that pitiful? To be that empty on the inside? Did you know we can do that if we walk in the flesh and are mindful of the things of the flesh and we set our affection on things below? We can do that exact same thing. These people had been consumed with it and caught up in it. And they were also caught up in the spirit of this age. And many, many average, lukewarm believers are caught up in it as well. Let us flee the spirit of this age. All right? Then in that case, how do we how do we look at this? How do we turn this around in such a way that God can teach us how not to do this. Well, let me just mention this. And it says this right here. And having men's persons in admiration. Do you know any particular person, believer, that we should have in admiration? That we should exalt as our spiritual hero? How about Jesus Christ? How about having his person in admiration? Adoring Him. Exaltation. To where we praise Him and we glorify Him. How about us being become more concerned about His cause and His image than ours? Is there not a cause, David said? And I've said, is there not a cause in this closing days of these last days? Is there not a cause? Yes. And it's the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to love him. I want to admire him. I want to adore him. I want to exalt him. I want him to be my hero. I want to bear his image. Romans 8 sounds like verse 29. What did God say? He predestinated us to be what? Conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Folks, I am consumed in my spiritual growth. I am consumed in my study and meditating and application of the Word of God to the coming just like Jesus Christ. I am consumed, it's one of my goals, to bear the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want Him to be my hero. Amen? All right, so we find do not walk after our own lusts. That's one way. That's our hope of deliverance from the spirit of this age. Number two, walk in humility. That's our hope of being delivered from the spirit. Our supreme admiration to the person of Jesus Christ because of the advantage, folks. What do we say advantage meant? The benefits. To us, it's the spiritual benefits that we can have by making him our hero. All right, that's three. Number four, separate. Oh, I like this one. Verse number 19. Let's read scripture first. 
Now here he goes again, speaking of these. In verse 16, what did he say? These are what? Murmurs, complaints. Verse 16, these same people he's talking about, be they who, now notice, who separate themselves sensual. Now the idea in the context here is that because they have given themselves over to lasciviousness is they separate themselves from anything that's pure. They have separated themselves from anything that has any moral boundaries. Nobody tells them how to live. They have separated themselves for sure. We've got plenty of scripture to prove that. They have separated themselves from godliness. And he says here in, in verse 19, these be they who separate themselves sensual. Well, of course, if you separate yourself from anything spiritual, what's left but to live after the five senses and to fulfill the desires of the five senses. You know what you call that? Lust. To fulfill the lust of your eyes of your ears, of what your fingers want to touch, what you put in your mouth, what you, and on and on it goes. These have become sensual. And notice he says this, listen, this is why they're sensual. Having not the spirit. That's what God said right there. They have become sensual. Now, let's turn this thing around. How, how can we learn from this that we might have a hope of deliverance and be getting caught up in the spirit of this age. Okay. How about start off with this? Let us separate ourselves. Separation is not a doctrine you hear a whole lot about anymore. But that's God's will. That's God's desire. That's why he said, set not your affection on things below, but things above. Separate yourself from this world. Separate yourself from sensuality, from allowing your lust to be controlled by your flesh. Well, then who should they be controlled by? What did he say? Having not the spirit. They, were, they had absolutely no control in their life of the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. But folks, if you want to be delivered from the spirit of this age, you need to be controlled completely by the Holy Spirit. You know how you can do that? By walking consistently in the Spirit all your waking hours. So number one, we ought to separate ourselves from sensuality under the control of the Holy Spirit. But we should not just separate ourselves uh, uh, un unto the uh, Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, but well, we need to separate ourselves unto the word of truth. So you can't separate the work of the spirit of truth from the word of the spirit of truth. You can't separate it. Because the Holy Spirit of God works in a believer's life not through mystical dreams and means. No, he works in your life through what saith the Lord. Through the written word of God. And so... He separate yourself not from the world, but separate yourself into the control of the Holy Spirit. You want to know how to be controlled by the Holy Spirit? Number one, walk in the Spirit. Number two, listen, number two, Genesis through Revelation. Study, meditate on these words. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He's the revealer of truth. When you study and you meditate, he will show you how to apply those truths in your thinking, in your actions, your conduct, your behavior. You will walk not only under the control of the Holy Spirit, but the way you will walk under the control of the Holy Spirit is by what says the Lord. What thus saith the Lord. You cannot separate the two. So separate yourself under the Spirit of truth and to the Word of truth. The next one is similar to that. And it's in verse number 20. Number 20. And in verse number 20, he says this, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy, now listen, 
building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What's he talking about? He's talking about how we can deliver ourselves. It's the hope of our deliverance from the spirit of apostasy, from the spirit of this age. Folks in the church, people, brothers and sisters in Christ in the church are dropping like flies. And that includes preachers. They are falling away from the Lord. They're falling away from the Word of God, which is the King James Bible. They're falling away from it, turning to new and modern versions. Yeah, that's just the working of the spirit of this age in your life. It's the best and the first step is to get you away from the truth of the Word of God, which is your only hope of deliverance. Build up yourselves in your most holy faith. All right, now listen carefully to what, what I just said. Not what, not what I just said, what the Holy Spirit just said. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now, now think about that. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now, doesn't it say somewhere in the Word of God, maybe Romans 10, faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by what? By the Word of God. So if you're going to build yourselves up on your most holy faith, what is the basis of doing that? Faith coming by hearing takes you right back to what we were just talking about. You have got to, to give attention to reading. It says that in the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. It says that in the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. It says that in the Word of God. And learn how to apply these truths to your life. So that you can escape, folks, the, the, you can be delivered from the spirit of apostasy and the spirit of this age. So, when he says, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, folks, we have got to be consumed, become consumed with walking in the spirit, and we've got to become consumed with studying the word of God. Well, how consumed, Brother Patrick? Well, we find in Hebrews 5, verse 14, We find in Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 14, that God says that we are to use the word of righteousness. And that word use, if you look it up, it means habitual use or habitually practicing the word of God. And what God tells you there is that if you'll do that, read the verse, you will qualify to become a full age. Then he says, those that do not use, in the previous verse, those that do not use the word of righteousness are babes that have need of milk. And in the verse prior to that, he said they have, they have need of, of, of teachers that will teach them the first principles of the oracles of God. Start all over again. Because they never matured in the use and the study of the Word of God. And so God says we've got to learn to use the Word of Righteousness. Read it. Hebrews 5, 14. Now listen. Here's what he says. To, now listen. This is so good. To exercise our senses. Aha. Uh -huh. And that word exercise comes from the Greek games. It's a Greek word. It comes from the Greek games. And it means... I say this reverentially. It means to practice naked. This is indicating the type of practice and exercise that they would do for the Greek games to, to, to attain the goal. Amen? And to, and to be in first place. To win the race. To win the competition. They would lay aside anything that was a weight. All their clothing and they would practice. Folks, that's the kind of intensity that we have got to have about studying the Word of God. You can find in, in, in Hebrews 5, verse number 12, 13, and 14, that God wants us to become highly skilled in the use of the Word of Righteousness. Okay, the use, the use. Oh, that's the habitual practice. Okay, what habitual practice is he talking about? He's talking about, he said it, he's talking about exercising your five senses through the truth of the Word of God. Whatever you look at with your eye, 
Make sure it lines up with the Word of God. Whatever you listen to with your ear, make sure it lines up with the Word of God, with what God has taught you. He's taught you what to listen to. He's taught you what not, what not to listen to, where you, where you put your fingers and what you touch and feel. You, it might be stealing something in a store. It might some be, be some illicit practice of, of a sexual desire. Who knows what it might be? But where are you putting these fingers? Where are you putting these hands? Ah, oh, we're to exercise our sense of touch based on the truth of the Word of God. Same thing to do with all your other senses. So, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, there, there's got to be an absolute, it, you, you should be consumed with becoming highly skillful in the use, the habitual use of the Word of God all day long in the exercising of your senses. And, and, and let me, let me, I'm getting close to closing here. Let, let me say this. Let's, let's finish the rest of that verse. He says, exercising your senses, now read it, it's right there, Hebrews 5, 14, to discern both good and evil. That, folks, that is a spiritual exercise program we should be involved in all our waking hours. You know why? Because all day long, we're looking at something. All day long, we are listening to something. Amen? We're tasting something, putting things in our mouth, touching things all day long. And so all day long, we should be guided by the truths of this book, habitually using the truths of this book to exercise our senses, to discern what is good and what is evil. And making the choice based on walking in the Spirit, based on pleasing God, to choose the good way and not the evil way. Building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. We'll close with this last reference. I'm going to turn to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Folks, you've got the option. You can, you can, you know it says in Hebrews chapter 2, to give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard. That's what it says. You read it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1. Give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard. I looked up that term, more earnest heed. I thought it was interesting. It meant super abundant attention to. Oh. And it meant super abundant consideration of. So when God said that we should give super abundant attention and consideration to the things which you have heard, which is what he told them, that's what he told them in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 1. He meant you ought to listen with all your listening ability. With all your, in other words, you ought to listen with your spiritual ear. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saying. Folks, you don't have to listen to these truths. But I'm assuring you, if you you ignore these truths, in fact, the Hebrews, even though they were told that, ignored these truths. And you know what? You know what God said to them in that same chapter, chapter two, just two verses down. He said, "How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation?" Not to love this book and give the work super abundant attention to what it says and consideration of its impact in our life is to live as a fool, is to walk as a fool and not as wise. And you will be consumed and may already be consumed by the spirit of this age. But now I said Proverbs 28, 9, let's look at this and we'll close. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law. Please listen. Listen carefully. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law. What, what's he saying? Refusing to give super abundant attention and consideration to the word of God. And the law of God. And God says, he that turns away his ear from hearing the law. Listen. Even his prayer shall be abomination. 
You know what abomination means, basically? It means hard stomach. It, it basically means disgusting. Can you imagine God saying that about you? About me? That my praying to him makes him sick to his stomach? That is absolutely disgusting? But you think about it. What do you say? He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law. What are you doing when you hear the law? You are listening to God. You are wanting to hear what he has to say. Well, isn't it kind of weird that you would want to, quote, listen to God Let me put it another way. That you would want to pray to God and you want Him to give you everything you pray for because you need it. You want it. But you're not willing to listen to Him with super abundant consideration and attention. He calls that ignoring His Word. And, and when it said in Hebrews chapter 2, how shall we escape? You know what he's talking about? He said it again in Hebrews chapter 12. Folks, you've got so great a salvation given to you. How are you going to escape the judgment of God? And that's what he's talking about in the context. If you refuse to hear the law of God, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. And let me say this. This is a biblical principle. God's judgment will come in the believer's life. You will pay for your sins, your neglect of the truth of the Word of God. Not in the judgment seat of Christ. We will pay for that in this life. This life. We will pay for that and we'll pay for it in our flesh. Folks, this is serious truth right here. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, and even his prayer shall be abomination. The day may come when you're in the middle of judgment, and God's judgment is falling on you, and you start crying out to God, oh God, oh God. And what does God say? He says, your prayer to me will be disgusting. Because see, you can cry out to God in the flesh, you can cry out, but folks, the only prayer he'll listen to is if you're crying out to him with a broken spirit in total humility, which is a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, if he can break your spirit and you'll surrender to his spirit and you will repent of those sins and you cry out to God, you can rest assured your prayer will not be an abomination to him. But in fact, he says the prayers of the saints are his delight. He will take great pleasure in your prayer. If you'll let him break your heart. Where were you? Where are you this morning as you look at these truths? And I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I love you. I love you in the Lord. God loves you. But where are you as far as your walk in the Lord? What's, what the hell? I don't know. I can't tell you. But the Holy Spirit can tell you. And the Holy Spirit may have told you. And if he told you that you're not right, then he, he has shown you that you're caught up in the spirit of this age. Don't panic. Listen to what the Spirit is saying, that still, small, sweet, loving voice. Let him take you by the hand, because this is what he's trying to do. Let him take you by the hand, and let him lead you through the blood gate. 1 John 1, 9. That's what he's trying to do. He's simply trying to bring you to repentance, where you will confess your sins to the Lord. And what does he say he'll do? He'll forgive you of all unrighteousness, at that very moment, you're walking in the light as He is in the light, and you have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Are you willing to do that? It's available this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for these rich and wonderful truths. Please seal these truths to our heart in Jesus' name.